I would like to welcome all of you to this conference on the United States and China Mutual Public Perceptions. Uh, this is a jointly sponsored by the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson Center and by the Center for U.S.-China Relations of Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing. Uh, we all know that impressions matter. We're often cautioned not to judge people by first impressions, which may be quite different from the underlying reality. If we pay attention to this advice, if we don't pay attention to this advice, we learn it from hard experience. Uh, we can't judge people, countries, by superficial surface impressions. But these impressions influence how people act, how they respond to people, to issues, and to countries in general. In the case of countries, perceptions can have a significant impact on policy. In 1989, China's image in the United States took a devastating blow from the television portrayals of developments in and around Tiananmen Square. This complicated the management of U.S.-China relations for over a decade. And when I was ambassador in China in 1993, when China had repudiated the swing to the left that occurred after the events of 1989 and had strongly gone back on the path of reform and openness, Americans coming to China were genuinely shocked to discover that what they saw in China was so different from the perceptions that were being pervaded in the United States about China. So in other words, we had a gap between the reality on the ground and the perceptions of that reality that were influencing policymakers in Washington. More recently, the Chinese image of the United States uh, as the master of finance has been shattered as evidence has emerged about the widespread financial mismanagement in the United States. And this has induced many Chinese to conclude that the United States is now a declining power. Uh, that could be a very dangerous conclusion if it is a misestimation of the vitality and the recovering ability of the United States. So again, perceptions are important. In the 20th century, the book that probably influenced American attitudes about China most significantly uh, is The Good Earth by Pearl Buck, which is getting a, a lot of attention uh, recently. It graphically portrayed the backwardness and the poverty of China, but it did so in a sympathetic way that made Americans have a positive impression of the Chinese people. But not surprisingly, Chinese intellectuals didn't like the book because it portrayed China as a backward country and China was trying to get out of the poverty at that time. The Chinese writer Lu Xun declared, it's always better for the Chinese to write about Chinese subject matter as that is the only way to get near the truth. Now I think we know in both China and the United States that when we write about our own country, we don't always uh, portray it in a way that gets near to the truth. And in fact, a Western viewpoint on that perhaps could be found in the Scottish poet Robert Burns, who hoped that we would have the power to see ourselves as others see us. And one of the purposes of this conference today is to try to get at this problem of seeing ourselves as others see us and understand what are the factors that contribute to these impressions and what the influence is an impact on uh, public policy. Uh, I hope that we will benefit from these insights today and we have a f outstanding group of presenters and I'm looking forward to the discussions and I hope you all will find them informative. Thank you. Uh, Professor Swin, would you like to uh, <coughs> make a few remarks also? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very delighted 
uh, to have all of you here today, this morning. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Ambassador Roy and uh, the Kissinger Institute of China and the United States. And I also want to thank uh, Mr. Douglas Spellman, who is the Deputy Director here. And uh, without your time and efforts, uh, it can, just cannot be happened today. And uh, uh, I remember Ambassador Roy once said, uh, the United States and China uh, did not have love, but work out a marriage uh, in late 1970s. So the problem is, is after 31 years, we still have a tough love with each other. <laughs> so there might be a, a wall of roses, uh, but uh, uh, we must not uh, fantasize uh, the other as a, a threat or as an enemy. So uh, I think you know, I, I'm very much worried about the perceptions be, because perceptions, mutual perception uh, uh, matters uh, because a recent survey showed uh, that uh, uh, the number of people holding negative views uh, towards each other are almost identical in the United States and in China. Uh, in China, for example, we find nationalist feelings and outcries against the United States. Uh, interesting, a sh survey shows from the Communist Party members, 74% have a more favorable views of the United States than those non-party members, 60%. <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, also the survey showed that in the United States, the people who believe that China in China's increasing power, in improved power capabilities, poses clear and present danger uh, to the U U.S. global interest. Uh, so what is noticeable is that the, the number of that number of Americans holding that view uh, remains quite constant and has even slightly increased over the past few years, despite the Chinese government's uh, efforts to defuse uh, such concern. So what we can do, uh, I think we come here to discuss these kind of conflicting views on um, basic uh, elements of uh, democracy, for example, the uh, religious freedom, human rights, uh, meaningful participation, this kind of thing. Um, I think uh, there are at least, uh, there is, is very significant to do this kind of uh, uh, work, uh, at least uh, uh, two overarching forces that motivate and shape uh, this uh, kind of a practice. The first is the continued uh, rise of China. Uh, in, as a global power. Uh, I think China is searching at its own soul. Uh, Chinese elites as well as general public has been devo deeply divided on the issue of how to meet the challenge and opportunities posed by the United States. And their political imagination of the United States also reflect uh, China's own understanding of the role it can play and should play uh, in the future. And also, I think the other elements is the President Obama's efforts and his administration's efforts to build up the uh, fixed American image uh, in the world and building up some kind of a soft power. Uh, I think that uh, so far the so-called smart democracy uh, diplomacy has won much credit from a lot of places in the world, but uh, has not yet won the heart of Chinese people. Uh, so that, that's why we see the recent uh, hated uh, debate on the uh, Yellow Sea and South uh, China Sea, uh, this kind of incident happened. So to my understanding, <coughs> I, I think special attention should, uh, should be paid on the following four issues during our uh, uh, discussion. The first, I think why we have to ask the question why uh, public perception is important and why does it matter and why now? Uh, who are the players shaping public perception, perception of the United States in China and China in the United States? And what are the processes you know, through which this kind of country image are created and circulated? And uh, the second question we have to ask, uh, I think uh, the key elements in democracy, uh, if we define the key elements in democracy, election, uh, rule of law, a uh, genuine part participation, human rights, uh, then what are the underlying conceptual differences when we're talking about the same idea or using the same word? Uh, to what extent the country image uh, reflect the nature of the government or the uh, different model of developments? Do we have a shared or deep-seated uh, inclination to rely on our own indigenous values 
to see the world. Or if China insists on its own model of development, do people believe that democracy is a good thing in China? Or uh, put into another word, can democracy made in China also possible? Uh, to what extent uh, the Chinese characteristics also we can incorporate Western elements of uh, democracy, you know, uh, into the uh, uh, the Chinese so characteristics of socialism, uh, this kind of thing. The third question I, I, I think we should ask the uh, impact of the uh, public perception on national policy. I think the uh, to, we have to ask the question to what extent the policy makers in our two countries uh, are influenced by public opinions or by, by this kind of perception, or do they manipulate uh, the public uh, uh, opinion to produce a uh, relevant uh, policy uh, result uh, in favor of their position? The last question I think we have to think about the uh, contribution. Uh, we can make as a scholar, as an uh, expert, uh, in shaping the public perception. Uh, I think the, uh, as our two countries are trying to build up our own soft power uh, abroad, we have to ask uh, if this national branding activity can improve our domestic uh, performance. I think our understanding and debating of these issues are important, since our efforts will affect our interest, our own perception, and uh, position in dealing with each other. Uh, I remember an English diplomat uh, told me that uh, uh, his country is trying to do a campaign, a launch a campaign, to transform the old, arrogant, uh, stuffy, old-fashioned, and cold Britain into a new, open, connected, creative, and dynamic country. I think we also have a mission here. Uh, this is uh, just a start. Uh, I look forward to hosting you and other people in Beijing probably next year. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Suan. Uh, we'll now launch into our first panel, which will deal with general perceptions. Uh, we have two speakers. Uh, the first is Terry Louts, who is a visiting professor at Syracuse University. Uh, former uh, vice president of the Henry Luce Foundation, and most importantly, uh, recently a public policy scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Professor Zhang Chuanjie of uh, Tsinghua University. Uh, professor Zhang is an assistant professor in the Department of International Relations, and he's the deputy director of the U.S. Uh, China Center uh, at Tsinghua. Uh, Terry? Dave, many thanks, and uh, it's a privilege to be with everybody this morning, and I'm grateful to uh, Ambassador Roy and uh, Dr. Spellman for uh, organizing this program. Um, I think perceptions and images are absolutely critical, and uh, perceptions have played a very uh, curious role in the relationship between the United States and China uh, over, over the history of this relationship. And I'd like to try to illustrate this and provide some historic uh, context through a series of visual images. These visual images are very, uh, very powerful. So this is the way I've organized my, my presentation. Do you have any problem with having the images on C-SPAN? I think these are all public domain. Uh, most of them have been uh, lifted from the web, uh, <laughs> Google images. So uh, I, I hope that's not a problem. If not, I hope you'll, you'll all visit me in jail. <laughs> um, I don't know if it would help to uh, dim these lights here, uh, but uh, I hope everybody can see well enough. Uh, Americans and Chinese share the same planet, but we use different road maps. <laughs> Where Americans see democracy, Chinese see chaos. Where Americans see repression, Chinese see stability. Americans see environmental pollution and currency manipulation, but Chinese see economic development and employment. We read each other's historic narratives with different assumptions. 
When Mr. Obama was preparing for his first trip to China last fall, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesman said the president should appreciate China's opposition to Tibetan independence because he's a black president who, quote, understands the slavery abolition movement and Lincoln's major significance for that movement. Lincoln played an incomparable role in protecting the national unity and territorial integrity of the United States, unquote. Most Americans thought this analogy was far-fetched. <laughs> From the beginning of the relationship, long before uh, Nixon's trip to China in the early 1970s, U.S. perceptions of China have been bifurcated between acceptance and rejection, admiration and contempt. These emotionally charged views loom large in the American culture, cultural and political imagination. These hopes and fears have been constructed around American exceptionalism and assumptions about American superiority, moral, economic, and political, assumptions that are now being challenged. During the early encounters, Americans often used racist stereotypes to portray China. China's history and culture was a source of fascination, but a weak, disorganized China in the 19th century was treated with disdain, the 19th and early 20th century, really on up to uh, fairly recent times. Cultural differences, miscommunication, and mistrust produced a series of negative images. Fear of the other is always a part of racism. The yellow peril, envisioned as a sinister alien force that would overwhelm the West, was alternately cast as a Chinese or a Japanese threat. Poor, uneducated laborers who came to work the gold mines and build railroads in the US fueled biased thinking. Irish American men and women competing for jobs in California felt threatened, and an 1882 act of Congress excluded most Chinese from the United States. And I don't know if you can read it, but uh, the Chinese uh, in the lower cartoon, political cartoons, being chased by uh, something labeled the Missouri Steam Washer uh, with a patent from 1881. Uh, and uh, the, the Chinese, uh, in this case, the Chinese laundryman is being uh, driven out. Racism could sometimes be amusing. For decades, Hollywood churned out movies featuring the diabolically evil Dr. Fu Manchu. He was always played by Caucasian actors in yellow face. <laughs> and racism often has a sexual dimension. Here's a pulp novel cover from the 1930s. Oriental men represented a curious mix of repulsion and appeal for Americans, while Asian women were either seductive courtesans or fearsome dragon ladies. In 1960, a Hollywood movie, Susie Wong, which is based on a, a uh, novel, uh, William Holden, uh, an American artist, falls in love with Nancy Kwan, a Hong Kong bar girl. This is a more sympathetic Cold War image of Asians as friendly allies. The image of China as a military threat is another long-standing theme in U.S.-China relations. There's a bitter legacy of confrontation between the U.S. and China, stretching back to the Boxer Uprising of 1900. The Korean Peninsula and Taiwan have been flashpoints for the past 60 years. This is a Chinese view from the early 1950s, depicting uh, a woeful President Truman, uh, a bandaged Chiang Kai-shek, Sigmund Rhee. And during the 1960s, the conflict in Vietnam was depicted by China as a battle against American imperialism. Uh, may what di what you we. And for the US, the enemy was communism. <laughs> so the battle of ideologies. This 1963 Time magazine cover depicts China's, Red China's leaders sailing a leaky dragon boat jammed with teeming faceless masses and an atomic bomb. And a new version of China as a threat and a source of conflict has emerged in recent years. 
Culture, economy, and military power, the new giant flexes its muscles, reads this Newsweek cover. The Western media has expressed considerable anxiety about China's, China's rise, which is regularly portrayed as a menacing dragon. And this issue of the U.S. Naval Institute's proceedings in May of 2009 carries the headline, Chinese Carrier Killer. The article by a Navy War College professor says, quote, the mere perception that China might have an anti-ship ballistic missile capability could be a game changer with profound consequences for deterrence, military operations, and the balance of power in the Western Pacific. Tibet, as we all know, is another point of contention. U.S. presidential meetings with the Dalai Lama imply to the Chinese that Americans seek to undermine China's territorial integrity. Americans and Chinese have also clashed over freedom of religion, in this case the Falun Gong, which is anathema in, in China. Altruism has been a potent counterpoint to racism and conflict in Sino-American relations. The history to do good, to instruct, to remake, to save others has been a constant theme in America's foreign relations. Missionaries, businessmen, diplomats have worked to help and improve China. From an American perspective, this was not cynic, sinister or territorial. It was simply the right thing to do. Early 20th century relations were shaped by the idea that China wanted to be just like the US. The fact that Chiang Kai-shek and his wife Sung Mei Ling were Christians led Americans to think this would actually happen. Here's General Joseph Stilwell with the Jiangs during World War II. American organizations like Oberlin Shanxi at Oberlin College and the Yale China Association at Yale, both founded over 100 years ago, were based on principles of cooperation, respect, and mutual benefit. Yale China provided medical training at Changya Hospital in Changsha, which continues to this day. Here's at Dr. Edward Hume negotiating the agreement in 1913. And after diplomatic relations were restored in 1979, America's altruistic instincts were revived and a new generation went to teach English and other subjects in China. American generosity could also be paternalistic as shown in this World War II poster which was used to raise money for Chinese refugees. This is an image of China as supplicant and ward. Paternalism and maternalism <laughs> show up today in the adoption of tens of thousands of Chinese or orphans over the last decade or so, more than from any other country in the world and almost all of them girls. And in recent years, American foundations and NGOs have worked to encourage Western-style civil society in China. The idea of an independent sector raises questions for the Chinese government. The search for common ground between China and the United States is another persistent theme that defines American views. What we now label as cultural and educational exchange is a movement with roots in the 16th and 17th century centuries with, when Catholic Jesuit missionaries concluded that Christian beliefs and Confucian philosophy were compatible. Both systems were based on concepts of moral goodness, self-improvement, and respect for fellow human beings. These evangelists from the China Inland Mission in the 1890s, both British and American, hoped for a kind of cultural synthesis between China and the West, as you can see from their adoption of Chinese dress. And the idea of accommodation between Christianity and Chinese culture is suggested in this window uh, from the Marino Catholic Mission 
headquarters in Austin, New York. The synthesis is also reflected in architecture. In the upper left, you see the Mary Knowles Seminary in Austin, New York. Uh, upper right is the library from Yenjing College, uh, built in the 1920s, now on the campus of uh, Peking University. And in the bottom, the new Suzhou Museum, designed by I.M. Pei. The 1930s ads for cigarettes reflected a fusion of Western and Chinese notions about beauty and fashion. And in the 1980s, Americans saw possibilities for common ground through global corporate ventures. In this case, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. What would Mao, depicted here in an Yves Saint Laurent jacket, think? <laughs> Americans and Chinese need to look beyond immediate policy issues to understand the context for our respective core interests and values. How do cultural assumptions influence our thinking about rights? Should primacy be given to the individual or the state? What is the role of law and religion in our two societies? We need to revisit and revise our images of China, realizing that China's power is growing and U.S. supremacy, or hegemony as the Chinese call it, cannot be guaranteed. Americans need to realize that a good versus evil, either they are with us or against us mentality, is misleading. Hubris is not helpful. The uneven emotional history between the U.S. and China cannot be changed. It may prove impossible to reconcile our contrasting worldviews, yet common ground can be identified even if convergence is not a realistic option. And this cartoon is a reference to the Star Trek television and movies series in the U.S. Who are they, Spock, Klingons, Romulans, Borg? They appear to be Chinese, Captain. <laughs> Americans no longer have a choice of accepting or rejecting engagement with China. They do have an option of seeing China more clearly with fewer illusions based on a dispassionate assessment of past experience and future needs. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, Professor John? Sorry, it takes some time. Um, hmm. So, is my place here? I need to turn this on. I'm not hot. Is Michael here? Yes. All right. I need some help here. Uh, Sorry, I don't know how to turn this on, so. Take some time, take some minutes. Okay, all right, no problem. Um, I would like to thank um, the Kissinger Institute in China and the U.S. Ambassador Roy, Dr. Spellman, to make this possible. And I also would like to thank uh, Michael for doing his work. Um, you know, during the, during the months, uh, I've been exchanging emails with Michael um, to the extent that my, I probably, it was like harassing him every day, you know, <laughs> with all these emails. Um, I, this one, yes. And I would like to thank the audience here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about this, uh, the, the effect of affective U.S. image uh, on Chinese citizens' attitudes toward U the United States. Um, it's basically, it's based on a public opinion study uh, in China. 
Now, unlike Professor Lau's, um, what pr um, Professor Lau's had a very um, impressive um, lecture on this, uh, the, the, the evolution of China, China images over time in the States. Um, but my talk is going to focus on um, the recent period from, from after 9-1-1. The reasons of doing this is because, um, oh, by the way, um, for these cameras, please do not um, cover my PowerPoint. I don't want to end up in jail in the U.S. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, some of the things here probably need some authorization from third parties. So I don't want to get into trouble. Um, so the reason I'm choosing this period is because um, it's, this period, especially after 9-1-1, saw an improved U.S.-China relationship where bilateral relationship um, has been both broadened and deepened to a non-precedented level. Um, so for ordinary Chinese, it is more likely for them to feel the existence of the U.S. in their everyday life. Um, now, this period, for example, the annual trade volume has increased from 116 billion U.S. dollars in 2000 to 635 billion U.S. dollars in 2009. Uh, this is actually data from the U.S. Census Bureau. So one, once the bilateral relationship has been brought much closer by the ties of trade and other exchanges, um, the Chinese public has developed much clearer attitudes toward the United States. So the probability of non-attitudes um, in the Chinese public toward the United States is quite low nowadays. Uh, I clearly remember when I, when I talked with a, uh, with a manager of a local survey company in China, uh, they actually started doing these surveys in the, in the mid-90s. Um, he told me that the problem then was the biggest problem they were facing when they were doing these public surveys is that when they asked the interviewees about their opinions towards foreign countries, uh, the probability that there is this non-attitude answer is, is above 40 percent. So. Um, <clears throat> that's in the 90s. Uh, and, and from the data we have here, uh, we think that uh, in, the, in the 21st century, um, so more and more people, ordinary Chinese people, they have clearer attitudes toward foreign countries, especially the United States. The other thing is that the aftermath of Tiananmen gradually died out in the, in the new century. Um, so in the 90s, back in the 1990s, there were these significant turbulences in the bilateral relationship. Um, that's the decade after Tiananmen. Um, so the Chinese public opinion toward the United States um, in, the, in the new century was not that volatile like it had been in the 1990s. So that, thus, it provides us with some opportunities to study, uh, to see a possible moving trend of the public opinion toward the United States. And also, um, it go, give us opportunities to study what factors um, influence public opinion in this regard, uh, without being confounded by other factors. Um, the third reason that I want to talk about this period is that um, in China, um, after 2000, well, this is a logistic question. Before 2000, before the year 2000, there, there were not many public opinion surveys in China that are being done um, on, on the public's foreign attitudes and their views of foreign countries. But after 2000, we have seen um, some study, uh, not as numerous as here in, in the U.S., but some studies um, uh, evaluating the public's thoughts in this regard. So the three questions that I want to ask um, is how do the Chinese public view the United States, and do their views matter in their foreign policy attitudes? Um, um, the, the views that I'm posing here are affective images, whether they like the United States or not. Does this affective image matter in the foreign policy attitudes toward the United States? And the third part is uh, very inconclusive, but um, it's going to touch upon the role of public opinion in China's foreign policy, um, which actually personally I doubt whether there is any role, but you know, uh, <laughs> I think things are improving. Okay, so. So here are some of the survey data that, um, that took place in China. Um, this is a 2001 survey. Uh, some, of the, some of the public uh, regarded the United States as an amicable state, but most of them, close to half of them, think it's competitive in the cooperator relationship, which is quite realistic, uh, which is quite similar to the realistic um, the re bilateral relationship between the United States. We are, we're not, we're not 
enemies, but we are not friends either. Um, so when, when the survey was redone in 2009, um, more, more and more people, 55.4 um, this time, um, they thought that the relationship was competitive and cooperative relationship. So we have more public converging in the center of the distribution, thinking that we are neither friends nor enemies. And then there, there was also this type of questions done uh, over the years, uh, the first impressions uh, of the United States. This is quite an open-ended question. Uh, now, we can see that in, 2000, in this 2001 survey, uh, most people will regard the United States as wealthy and powerful. This is the, as their first impression of the United States, followed by you know some um, social problems, seeing exposed American products. You know, but this is like compared with the first category. These last three categories are really like you know um, very little effect here. Um, so another survey in 2003, uh, we see some some uh, categories popping up. And we are seeing a powerful still is the first impression of most Chinese public of the United States, their first impression of the United States. Um, but this survey was done in 2003, so the war event um, came up as the second category. And we have the global political power, the United States as the global political power, this impression came the third. Um, about a quarter of the public thought the United States as a global political power. And then this is a most recent survey. Um, you know, well seen and powerful is all is always the first category, um, and then we saw this arrogant thing: uh, democracy, freedom, and the United States as word police. Um, so, the from these findings over time, we saw that particularly two two changes in uh, the Chinese public's first impressions of the United States. The first one is that Chinese citizens' first impressions have become more diversified in 2009 than in 2001. Um, and the second one is that these first impressions have become more politically related uh, about more serious topics. Uh, remember in 2001, we still have little pub, some of the people think, you know, America stands for scenic spots, uh, Grand Canyon, Las Vegas. Uh, um, but in 2003 and 2009, we don't see this anymore. Um, so these, we, we have seen more politically related categories. Now there's a one question in the 2009 survey, which issue has biggest impact on US-China relations? As you can see, um, this is predominantly, uh, overwhelmingly important issue on Taiwan. So apparently Taiwan issue is the core that the Chinese public think uh, is the core of the bilateral relationship between China and the United States. So that is why the Chinese public could so easily be angered by American arms sales to Taiwan. Well, the sources of this uh, Taiwan issue as the core of the U.S.-China relationship of this perception are uncertain. Uh, where well, some people will argue, you know, this is more like a socialization process, the consequence of socialization and education in mainland China. But given that the public think Taiwan issue is the core, um, I think the, for, the, for the Chinese leadership, they could feel the pressure, um, th this political pressure, not to act soft, but play tough uh, once the United States approves arms sales to Taiwan. So if there is any manipulation on the government side, then the government only hoped to soothe the emotions of the public, but not the other way around, by manipulating or arousing the public's emotions in this respect. Um, and then we have some data about how the public view the United States, uh, whether they have this favorable or mostly f uh, m favorable image of the United States. As we can see um, from 2009, it, it's almost like percentages of interviewees holding very favorable or most favorable image of the United States is above 50 percent, more than half of them. And there's this uh, sudden increase after 2005, uh, 2006. Um, and I've, I've seen some data of, um, in 2007 and 2008, but it's not included in this uh, presentation. Um, but after, let me tell you, after 2005, the percentage is actually went higher, uh, 66 in 2006, and in 2007, somewhere also above 60 percent. So um, the, the public opinion in China toward the United States um, actually um, improved significantly after 2005. Unlike the bilateral relationship, which improved 
somewhere after 2001, 2002, um, the public opinion seemed lagging behind the real bilateral relationship. So uh, this is another index. Uh, this is actually an average, a mean ta taken out of this uh, favorable, un un unfavorable image. Now, if you look at this um, index over time, um, the benchmark is 2.5. If it's below 2.5, then the average feeding is negative. Above 2.5, it is positive. So if you look at the survey data over time, then um, you know, the, the, the critical point was passed after 2005. Uh, again, the same pattern as shown by the previous uh, data set. Um, so after 2005, the blue feedings have become more warm, you know, um, passing the benchmark of this uh, um, indifferent feedings. So there's another, uh, this is another item in a survey in 2006, you know, uh, um, asking the publics their image of American culture, American people, and the George W. Bush. You know, um, as you can see, you know, uh, American culture more attractive than George W. Bush at that time. But uh, my guess is that, um, well, I haven't seen any data for George W. Bush after, but my guess is that after 2005 and 2006 or 2007, um, George W. Bush um, has become more and more popular in China, especially among the young Chinese generation. Um, it's very mysterious, very interesting. Uh, last semester, we have a delegation from the U.S. visiting our center. These are former congressmen. We asked some Tsinghua students to, you know, to, con to have a dialogue with these former U.S. congressmen. Now, one of the students, um, he's actually a master's student from our center. Uh, we didn't have him rehearse. But at the meeting, he told the former congressman that from, from his opinion and from, from his talks with his uh, roommates and um, classmates and the students at Tsinghua, they think that um, they missed George W. Bush, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there were, there were like two totally different opinions among these U.S. congressmen. Some of them were uh, uh, Republicans. Uh, they would say, yes, we should invite you to come to the United States, tell, tell the U.S. audience. But, you know, some of them are Democratic, so they were kind of like, uh, you know, they, they couldn't believe it. Uh, but let me tell you, this is really... Uh, really uh, a true feeling among the Chinese young generation. The reasons, to me, I don't know why, but um, it seems they, they, they like George Bush more after 2007, 2008 um, than they like um, President Obama, and, and then they like, uh, like George W. Bush back in 2005 or 2006. Um, so the second question that I want to ask is, um, what do public views in this regard matter in, in, in the public's foreign policy attitudes? Well, uh, the first question is, is there is a constraint in the public's foreign policy beliefs? This is actually has its starting point in, in the <coughs> United States, in pol political science literature. Uh, one in the 1950s, there's uh, Gabriel Ormond's book. Um, he actually proposed this mood theory. According to Almond, most Americans lack intellectual structure and factual content on their foreign policy attitudes. So uh, such superficial psychic states are bound to be unstable since they are not anchored in a set of explicit value and means calculations or traditional compulsions. So um, there's, this, uh, there's this suspicion among scholars that the public's foreign policy attitudes are quite like a, in a mess. Uh, there is uh, no consistent logical structure structure in the public's understanding of foreign policy issues. Um, and then later we s we've seen some other literature uh, challenging this point. Now the question here is that we want to, want to ask the same question, whether the Chinese public have consistent and logical thoughts on their foreign policy um, beliefs. And the second question is, does the U.S. image they have the, the, the image, the affective image they have of the United States predict their foreign policy, specific foreign policy attitudes toward the United States. Um, this is actually a study that I've done. Um, I just published a paper in this. Um, I'm, I'm probably I'm going to send the email to Michael, get the attachment to Michael. Um, I was trying to find some some place yesterday to print these papers, but you know, Kinkos was was not open for Sunday. Uh, um, you know, in China, uh, almost all shops are open on Sunday, but <laughs> not in the, in, in the States. 
Um, okay, so we, we actually have some questions uh, measuring people's um, opinions on, on this uh, global trade thing, me measuring their free trade outlook, and we have some questions measuring their uh, national security outlook. Um, so, and then there was some, this uh, structure equation modeling uh, thing done. And let me tell you the result. Um, the public's, the Chinese citizens' attitudes, um, uh, their foreign policy attitudes are quite consistent, organized, and structured. Um, so it's not really as unorganized as we, we might think of. Um, and the second thing is as whether their U.S. image plays any part in their, in their answers to these survey questions. Now, I, I set up two examples here. Now, two hypothetical questions in the survey is, it, it is like the, the survey done by the Chicago Council on Foreign, um, this Council on Foreign Relations. And the first question is, hypothetical question, not real question. If the United States invades, invades North Korea, uh, would you favor or oppose Chinese government sending forces over there? Second question is, um, if the United States asks the Chinese government to send troops overseas to fight terrorism with the United States, would you favor or oppose the government sending forces abroad? So um, this is a two-by-two two table of the answers in the survey. Um, now, we know that if, if a person is a hawk, then the hawk tends to say yes in both cases. If the, if the in interviewee is a dove, then he or she is more likely to answer no in both cases. But we, are tend, to, we tend to expand why some people choose to fa favor one case but not the other one. Uh, so an, again, another structural equation modeling. Let me tell you the result is that, you know, um, the perception, the affective perception of the United States by these Chinese citizens matters in their, in their choosing different answers. Um, those who have a more favorable image of the United States are likely to favor the Chinese government sending forces um, to fight terrorism with the United States, but to oppose sending forces to, to the hypothetical North Korean uh, scenario. Um, and, and, and those with a less favorable image of the United States choose otherwise. Um, and also, through other studies, we have found that the, United, the U.S. image uh, held by these Chinese citizens also predicts their outlook on U.S.-China relations. Those having more favorable image of the United States tend to um, be more optimistic about the United States and China relations in the future, in the future 10 or 20 years. So the, the other thing is uh, about this demographic and socioeconomic factors of U.S. image. We did something in the structural equation modeling context, and we listed some of the demographic features that we think might, might influence a, pe a person's U.S. image. They are gender, age, education, um, household income, and uh, the, the thing is Beijing and Shanghai. That is the last variable, because this survey was collected in Beijing and Shanghai. So guess which of the factors are can predict their U.S. image. Um, let me ask you this question. Which of the factors do you think influence the Chinese citizens' attitudes toward the United States? Gender, age, maybe older Chinese don't like the United States because of the years they have, you know, the education they have received or you know, the, the Cultural Revolution thing. Uh, maybe. Um, education, maybe highly educated people are more likely to have favorable image of the United States and the household income. We have a lot of hypotheses and guesses before we, we did this survey, we analyzed the data, but it turned out that um, gender, age, education, household income, none of these have any effect predicting their U.S. image. <laughs> the only factor that can predict the difference is Beijing and Shanghai. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that Shanghai people are more likely to have favorable image of the United States. Contribute uh, to CG's, former <laughs> CG's yes, work. Former CG's. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revise my paper. You know, this is really the, the work you have done. Um, now, in my paper, you know, one possible explanation is that Shanghai is more like a more globalized city. Um, its citizens are more likely to get benefits from this uh, China's opening up to the world and a better relationship between China and the United States. 
while Beijing is more like a politics oriented city. People, you know, people talk about politics every day in Beijing. Um, if any of you have been to Shanghai and Beijing, it's totally kind of different mood there. In Beijing, if you take taxi driver, um, chances are very likely that this taxi driver <laughs> knows more about Zhongnanhai than you do. <laughs> but in Shanghai, if you take a cab driver, probably the cab driver will talk about how to make money, uh, how to start your own business. So it's totally different from Beijing and Shanghai. Very interesting. Age, you know, age, education, and income, we thought they should be strong indicators, but it turned out that they have no effect. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the role of public opinion in China's foreign policy? Well, we have seen the increasing role of public opinion in China's political life. You know, nowadays, um, the top leaders in Zhongnanhai, they pick up blogging and internet, internet comments so they can act real quickly in a very quick fashion to some of, some of the blogging and internet comments in China. Now, I, let me give you an example. Please do not, um, do not shoot this picture, the back of cameras. <laughs> um, so here's a very uh, famous example in China hap happening sometime the, um, last year. Um, this is a local official in the city of Nanjing. He's kind of, this is an official, this official is um, in charge of the Bureau of Real Estate. In, in the city, in a, in a suburb area in the city of Nanjing. So he, the pictures you, you are seeing here is that he's attending a, a, a meeting. And at the meeting, um, the pictures were taken and it, it turns out that the cigarette, the first picture on the left, the cigarette, the pack of cigarette he smokes costs 30 US dollars a pack. So I couldn't imagine any cigarette here in the US you know, <laughs> costing 30 US dollar a pack. Yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and then the watch he, he, he was wearing at the second picture on your right uh, is worth like 30,000 US dollars. His salary is more like, well, it's more like the same as I am earning at Tsinghua <laughs> University. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so someone posted these, these pictures on the internet. And guess what? Um, the, the central government or the provincial government reacted very, very quickly to this. They sent, a, sent an investigation team to the case, they investigated the case, and it turned out that uh, this official was actually taking bribes, <laughs> and he was thrown to prison for 11 years in China. Uh, so this actually is a very typical case of the increasing role of public opinion in the form of the internet opinion on Chinese political life. Uh, so things are changing in China. Now, um, what about the increasing role of public opinion in China's foreign policy? Uh, as Professor Sun has said, you know, we, we are uncertain. Uh, some of our reports, we can have write some policy reports, and then we, there are some channels that some of the pro top scholars, they can send their policy reports to the top leadership. But as for the effect, we have no idea. Um, but things are improving, things are, uh, are changing. Um, last year, one, well, this year, actually, this first half of the year, uh, when China was facing enormous pressure from the United States on IMB revaluation, re the central government actually sends dozens of in investigation teams to the southern prov provinces of China, where they have this uh, concentrated manufacturing plants in China. So these investigation teams, when they, when they went to southern China, they talked with small business owners there. They're trying to, you know, trying to see how much RMB evaluation is tolerable for these plants to survive. So this is a way of getting foreign policy um, bottom up. You send investigation teams to local provinces, you try to gauge their opinions, and then when all these investigation teams come to the central government, come, come back, they will, you know, they will um, summarize all these uh, things they have learned, and then um, based on this, uh, they will probably get some policy out on this RMB evaluation. So I think this is a, um, at least this can be viewed as a good starting point, you know, um, getting this uh, bottom-up approach. Well, is public opinion a good thing for foreign policy? Uh, we all know that a well-informed public is a healthy and a good thing generally uh, for politics. Um, but you know, for, for, for some political leaders, uh, it always, there's always this temptation to brush aside the public opinion and act on your own. 
uh, like when I was organizing this conference, when I was organizing all these top scholars from China, um, sometimes, you know, for me, public opinion is a bad thing because I want to be the dictator so that I can push all the <laughs> things going. And I think probably Michael has the same feeling, you know, <laughs> he should be the dictator here so that we can get all these, you know, push all these things going on. Um, but the problem in China nowadays is that there were no, not many, there were not adequate uh, channels to gathering to estimating public opinion. So um, the, the, the most apparent form of public opinion, the most obvious form, is the, this unbalanced internet opinion. Let me tell you something. In, Chi in China, um, those who, went, who go to internet cafes every day, um, most likely they are young, they are unemployed, they skip schools, uh, skip, skip classes, and they, they, they go there and then, you know, sitting before a computer all day long. Uh, well, I, I, I read some news that uh, there was this, this, is this young man who was sitting uh, before in front of the computer for like 48 or 56 hours uh, on end. Um, you know, so the most people who are likely to leave some internet comments and you know, are young and unemployed um, people. Um, in China, it, you, you don't need a job to spend your time in internet cafes because it is so cheap. So um, if, if public opinion is in the form of this unbalanced internet opinion, is that conducive and, and helpful in US-China relations? Because if you look at the internet comments and blogging nowadays, um, at some times, uh, in, it could be excessively nationalistic and very nasty. Um, so if the central leadership uh, thinks that this is a form of public opinion, then it is actually an unbalanced public opinion. So um, well, I will let other scholars, you know, um, they probably know more than I do, uh, to talk about this link between public opinion and foreign policy. Um, so, yes, that's my, um, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> We have about 15 minutes uh, during which we can have some discussion or uh, questions from participants here. Terry, do you want to make any comment uh, uh, on the basis of uh, <coughs> Professor Zhang's presentation? I, I'll just say I thought the uh, Professor Zhang's presentation and uh, my more, more general background were very complimentary, at least I hope everybody thinks so. Uh, but I think. Um, what distinguishes U.S. public opinion about China from the flip side, Chinese views, is the uh, American consistency in its inconsistency. Uh, the, the, the fact that Americans keep swinging back and forth between, American, uh, between positive and negative has been uh, very impressively consistent over time. But the problem, the underlying problem, is that just leads to confusion and uncertainty. Mm. And I think this is just an enormous challenge because we do have this split mind as Americans about China. And it's increasingly difficult to reconcile that and increasingly uh, just not helpful to, to have this split vision. And I think we have a, a perceptions lag uh, in the United States when it comes to the reality of China. But on, at the same time, I think the Chinese themselves are grappling, I think as Professor Sun said, with the reality of China as a growing power. And so it's not just self-image or American interpretation, but it's also a reflection of a certain amount of, of uncertainty, anxiety, uh, concern about the future in China. So I think the problem really lies on, on both sides, as, as, as with, we both suggested. OK, does anyone, yes, in the, in the rear there? I want people to identify themselves. Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, Trudy Rubin, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Professor Zhang, at the end you mentioned the word nationalism. And I apologize, I missed the introductory remarks. But I'm wondering how the nationalism factor feeds in. I noticed in 2003 there were a lot of negative feelings. Well, that was after, uh, um, it, you know, that was after the Iraq War. 
where does the factor of um, Chinese self-image as a growing power and the possibility that somehow the U.S. might inhibit that factor into the, the swings up and down in attitudes towards the U.S.? Um, well, for these surveys, because this is uh, more like a survey on foreign policy attitudes, so there's, um, I don't think there are many questions or any questions uh, trying to estimate this uh, so-called nationalism among the public. Um, you know, in a way, um, <coughs> when I talked about at the end of this, uh, this, of this PowerPoint is that um, you know, when, you, when you pick up this internet commenting, when something pops up in U.S.-China relations, when you, when you observe these internet commenting in China, um, to me it is very, some of them are very radical extreme. Um, so what I mean is that if you don't have other channels of estimating knowing how the public think, if you rely on this only on this internet commenting, um, it could be dangerous. Um, that's my point. Uh, and the other thing is that, well, it's not related to your answer, but the other thing is that sometimes I think U.S. and China are very similar, uh, like each other, are like each other, um, more like each other than we than we think. Uh, when I read the news nowadays, you have this problem. The U.S. you have this oil spilling problem in the Mexican Gulf. Um, I don't know any of you knows this, but in China, from yesterday on, we have the same problem: <laughs> oil spilling in our Yellow Sea. There's this uh, or pipeline explosions. So, um, to some extent, I think the two countries were. Well, both of them are big countries, and they have some shared responsibilities or shared problems. So sometimes they are they are more like each other than different from each other. Yes. Yes, sir. Here in the middle. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, my name is Ya Feng Xia. I'm a public policy scholar here at the Wilton Center. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm very interested in knowing the role of the think tanks on the foreign policy making in China. Now, for example, uh, leading scholars like you people here, uh, and also I see in the audience uh, uh, some of the leading scholars on U.S.-China relations. Uh, my question, uh, I want to be a little uh, specific that uh, uh, do you uh, have regular, like uh, regular interactions with the policy uh, practitioners. Let's say people in the uh, in the Department of uh, American and Oceania Affairs, like uh, the current uh, Director General uh, Zheng Zeguang, or some uh, senior retired uh, Foreign Ministry uh, officials or ambassadors. They return to China. To, uh, for example, uh, at this, some of them serve as resident scholars at uh, either Tsinghua or Beida, so we get some sense uh, how, what kinds of interaction you have uh, between uh, think tank and uh, uh, foreign policy practitioners and uh, policy makers. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not sure I'm the appropriate person because um, yeah. Among the delegation members, I'm the most junior one. Uh, <laughs> just surviving my, my boring days at New Haven. So uh, probably Professor Sun has something. Uh, maybe it, yes, uh, it's a very good question. I just want to, and perhaps you could give an answer, but could we keep the focus of our questions on the public perception aspect? Yeah. Uh, this is not a, uh, a conference on formulation of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one minute, uh, 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 give me an email. I wrote a paper on the role of think tank plays in Chinese foreign policy. It's, uh, I have both Chinese and English version. I think we pl just play five roles, and uh, we are policy advisor, we are reviewer, we are remonstrators, you know, something like that. Five roles we play, but we also have a uh, advantage and disadvantage. I think uh, like, uh, like uh, in this room, our participants, we have uh, seven or eight of them. At least half of them are TV stars. They do the t regular in the, uh, TV interviews uh, three or four times a, a, a week, you know, something like that. So, uh, and also we serve for the, uh, as a senior consultant to strategic economic dialogue. So we play a more active role. But anyway, uh, send me an email. I would like to uh, add one finger. So I think we have a 400 million 
uh, uh, internet user in China, uh, about 100 million uh, bloggers. So it's very hard to to evaluate what we I call cyber nationalist uh, sent sentiments. You know, that's the uh, there is no such a Gallup poll agency in China. They only have a, a one. Uh, Lingdian, uh, how the, how the yeah, horizon, the horizon, you horizon. know, only one poll uh, agency, so it's not a lot, so it's very hard to give an accurate descript description on this uh, 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 nationalist uh, um, uh, sentiment. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning, my name is Bridget Han. I am actually an international student from China. I'm a sophomore going to school in Missouri and currently intern this summer at DC. I just have a question about one of the survey um, professor John has done. You said um, that it seems like the age, household income, education, and gender are not strong indicators uh, influencing the popular perceptions to the U.S. Is it suggesting that the channels through which the public in China is receiving information about foreign policies in the foreign country are somewhat monotonic, isolated, not very comprehensive? And what do you think why this problem exists? Thank you. Well, I wouldn't think that it is a problem. It is actually a statistical finding from the data set. Um, as well, probably in the in the near future, when we have more data sets, um, we have more opportunities to test all these hypotheses. But from this data set al alone, we don't see any effect. Uh, let me tell you why this is not a problem. Uh, because on the other hand, when we when we've seen these results, I think sometimes you know um, they could make sense. Um, I live in Guangdong province, the southern province of Guangdong. I work in Beijing, so I fly back and forth. Back and forth. Um, I know uh, some small businessmen, well, some of them are really rich in Guangdong province. They have a uh, lot of manufacturing plants. Um, and this group of uh, businessmen that I, that I know in Guangdong province, they're quite local. Uh, they make money, in the, they made their money in the 80s, and they retired in the 90s. Um, so um, most of them, uh, when I was having this conversation over dinner, lunch, over, over alcohol with them, um, most of them, it seems to me that most of them are quite anti-U.S. rather than pro-U.S. So for this example, uh, that probably explains that income probably doesn't matter. Um, in, uh, the original idea is that if, 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 if someone is rich in China, then he's more likely to have favorable image of the United States. But that's not true. That's not true. At least from the data set, it is not true. And then um, there there might be some factor, you know, that could explain it. So I don't think that's a problem. That doesn't mean the public are isolated. Um, you know, actually, as an ordinary people, as I am in China, I have full access to websites outside of China. I know there is this firewall going on uh, at the last. Uh, conference, I told Professor Sun, you know, there's always this chance for young people to get out of the firewalls. Uh, it's, it's a technical problem. It's, it's, it can be solved. And as, as I said, every morning when I, the first thing that I, when I go to my office at Tsinghua Cambridge, the first thing is that I'm going to I'm going to climb out of the firewall. Um, I'm going to Don't let me know. <laughs> I'm going to visit the national uh, this uh national public radio. I'm going to listen to the NPR news every morning in, Ch in Tsinghua campus. Yes. So I would suggest you add uh, one question ask th those rich people do you ask them uh, do they have a bank account in in the United States? Do they <laughs> do they plan to send their That's children to the to the states? So they don't they don't let you know. That's too <laughs> private, you know. <laughs> That's too private. But the thing that I want to tell you is that uh, for me um, as I said I I just recently graduated from Yale. Um, the the life that I'm in the Tsinghua campus is almost the same as I'm, I was in New Haven. So I have full access to all kinds of information, all kinds of healthy information. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Zhang, there's a question from the uh, overflow room uh, from a freelance correspondent named Chen. 
uh, is are the surveys based on on uh, urban residents only, or, or they also include the rural population? Almost all of these surveys are um, urban residents. There's no well. There's it is almost out of question to get these things down in a field in the, in the, in the country in the suburb in China. Um, I think this is a logistic. They have some logistic and the cost of reasons. So. Um, but you know, things are changing, things are improving. Hopefully, uh, it's going to be more, um, it, it's going to cover more people. Uh, yeah. But for the moment, almost all these data sets are collected in metropolitan areas in China. Yes. Terry, did you have a I, uh, You mentioned the contrast between public opinion in Beijing and Shanghai. I wonder if we would see the same thing between New York and Washington <laughs> exactly. here in the U.S. <laughs> Certainly, if you went to the U.S. Congress and asked the congressional staff, uh, based on a uh, committee of 100 poll that was conducted a couple of years ago, the congressional staff were uh, much more negative about China than the public in, in general. It's a rather uh, shocking contrast. Uh, also, uh, you mentioned the comparison of Chinese support for Americans uh, should there be a conflict mm -hmm. uh, in Korea versus terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, a similar question has been posed to American Public, American public opinion polls on whether Americans would support uh, intervention in Korea or Taiwan. Yes. And consistently, Americans say, yes, uh, we are willing to go. A majority would go, go into Korea. We're already there, of course. But no, Taiwan, uh, we would not support militarily. So there is this, uh, I think, important distinction. And as you've already suggested about the Chinese side, there's there's a good deal of consistency over right. time right. Uh, in the polling data on the American side. Right. Uh, let me just add some follow-up. Um, the Taiwan question, the, the Council on Foreign Relations data set, they have do, done this uh, quadrennial survey since 1972. Um, the Taiwan question uh, kept popping up in the questionnaire as an item, as a normal item in the questionnaire. Um, but but there's one case that this uh, this uh, opinion has been changed. Uh, um, in 2007, uh, President Hu Jintao invited 100 Yale faculty and the students to visit China for 10 days, extravagant trip. Um, so I was at Yale at the time, so I have access to these students who who went to China. Now the criterion for having these students on board is that they had they had never been to China before, uh, and in many of the colleges there's this lottery. It's a very random selection of students going to China. And then I have uh, identified some other students who wanted to go but who didn't have the chance to go to the trip. And I used uh, the, some of the question items from the Council on Foreign Relations um, surveys and asked these two groups of students, guess what? The, the students who have been to China are m much less likely to favor sending U.S. troops to the Taiwan scenario than those, those students who haven't been to China. Well, that, that also makes sense. I mean, these students are really, you know, they, they are quite spoiled in China. Um, they, they, they had this uh, state dinner at the, the, the uh, they, they were invited by pres President Hu Jintao himself. Everywhere they went, you know, there's this police escort, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite an expensive trip of them. Uh, and it must have some effect, you know. <laughs> if I could just add a footnote, uh, back in the 1950s, a uh, journalist uh, named Harold Isaacs did a survey of leaders in the United States. And he polled them uh, in depth on their, uh, their images, their impressions of both China and India. And he called the book Scratches on Our Minds. And the reason for the title was his conclusion that these first impressions, quick trip to China, police escort, you know, in invitation from Hu Jintao, that these first impressions can be enormously formative, but by the same token, Isaacs concluded these are superficial and they're volatile. They change very easily. Yes. The other thing that he learned, which I think has been borne out by, by the history over time, is that they do seem to come in positive and negative pairs. And this explains the, the flip-flop right. nature. So we need, right. we have multiple layers of problems. We need right. to get below or beyond the superficiality. Right. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop thinking in terms of the bifurcated positive-negative mm -hmm. right. uh, structure. Right. And we've been captives, captives of that. Right. You said we're not friends, we're not enemies. <laughs> 
we're, we're frenemies. Yes, <laughs> frenemies. yes. Um, just one more thing. Uh, yes, I agree, totally agree with you. I read that book, Scratches on My Mind. Um, the, these effects by traveling could be short-term, volatile, easy to reverse. Um, but on the other side, the good thing is that um, let's take an example of these year students who went to China in 2007 for the time. I personally know some of them, um, you know, they, they liked the trip and they were planning for more trips to China. Uh, I think that's the beginning of their uh, future, you know, um, the, 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 they want to know more about China. So that's a, also a good thing. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank both participants. Uh, we are now going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, we will assemble for our next uh, topic two at uh, 10.30. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.